Um, uh, so what we're doing in the Historic Greens project is we're working with communities to, um, uh, uh, it started as an archaeological survey from my perspective. I'm, I'm, I'm also a proud uh, uh, artisan, uh, except I'm, a, I'm an archaeologist. Um, uh, and uh, we started doing archaeological surveys of headstones, but uh, when we became, when we followed on the leader ethos, which we, um, it took us about six months to a year working with different leader companies around the country who are our main funders, they said, look, John, it's community led. And we weren't really sure what that meant at the start, but it took us a while. And once we got it, once we got that ethos that a community has to be in charge of the project, that a community has to have the energy to drive it on and they have to feel a sense of ownership. Once we got that, then the project changed from being an archaeological project to uh, community genealogy, to uh, anthropology. And it, it really became about fleshing out uh, the, the ruins of the past. It came about attaching names to places. And for me, as a field archaeologist, I was all about the place and I was all about the thing, the object, if I can put it that way. Whereas for, for us, over the last four years, it's been a great education. Now I think every time I talk to a fellow archaeologist, where's the people? Uh, it took me a long time to learn it, so uh, I, I'm willing to espouse it. In this project, uh, I'm going to talk m mostly about County Cork and County Limerick. Uh, the, uh, in the last three years, we've published over 127 graveyards in Cork, uh, uh, 101 in Limerick. Uh, that's over 30,000 grave memorials published online. Uh, Eric Cobblesche, uh, stone, and, uh, stone and iron memorials uh, up online there as well. Uh, it, took, it took me a few months to get my head around the, the iron crosses, but ever since, I think for the last three and a half years, we've been photographing every single iron cross that we've come across in the graveyard. Uh, so it was fascinating hearing uh, the, the, um, the, the craftsman's view on it as well. And maybe now I understand why I was doing it. I had an inkling that it was important, and, and now I have a stronger sense of why it is. So of 30,000 memorials that are up online, 29,500 have been taken by some of the people who are sitting in this room here now. I recognise some of the faces. By community groups, not by archaeologists in their big boots, but by people from a parish recording their own parish's um, uh, graveyards. Uh, uh, over 20 gig gigabytes of data archived with county library services and funded, and very importantly, funded with EU funds through the leader development companies who, who, who've had the imagination to actually see where we were coming from and to see that our approach suited their communities. And also then, in turn, supported... Uh, uh, in terms of the uh, logistics and uh, 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 by Limerick and Cork County Councils. And what we had was a very strong collaboration of us with a bit of technology and a bit of training, uh, community groups with the energy and the knowledge, and the funding bodies uh, um, uh, and the local authorities. A very strong collaboration. And all based on the community ethos. Uh, I put this group up because they're our most successful group on a daily basis. This was uh, just last February. Uh, we recorded 90 uh, headstones in a single day, fully recorded uh, uh, geotagged photographs and record sheets. There's two archaeologists in the photograph and there's, there's nine local community members. We were frozen. It, it snowed on that day, but the light conditions were absolutely perfect. So we were able to read with the naked eye, headstone after headstone after headstone. And the lads kept saying, how, how about a cup of tea, John? I said, God, you're flying. <laughs> so we kept going. Uh, uh, and before I delve into it now, I'm just going to ask you to squint at this fella here. This is from Cloncrew down in South Limerick. Have a look at that and just read that line that's lit up with the lens or P7. Uh, what can you see? Try and, try and remember it for later on, okay? Okay, now you can see there's a few hints as well there as well. There's something a bit more complex going on and I'll come back to that. Throughout the whole thing, like I say, we fleshed out our sites and one of the key things that, that happened for me was there was an opportunity to actually to mix with people and to, and to watch what's going on. In this case, I think this is Clan Keen, is it? Uh, there's, um, is it Des Humphreys? Uh, they're digging a grave. One of their neighbours um, died. And as we were recording the headstones, they were also uh, digging the grave. A fascinating opportunity to go over, let the lads do the work, go over and look into the grave and see what's going on. As an archaeologist, I'm interested in the soil. Uh, but then also to ask questions, uh, did you ever come across a coffin? How often do you come across a coffin? What about human remains? Uh, how long do they last? And the experts are there with the shovels in their hands. They're the lads who are digging graves every year, if, if not more, uh, uh, sometimes uh, every few months. Uh, they have a huge experience, so it's fascinating for me as an archaeologist to be able to query them. So we've come across a whole load of anecdotes. In fact, in this case, uh, uh, Dave was there, and I asked him, did you know the chap who's been buried? He said, did I know him? I marked him. He said, I was corner back, and he was corner forward. Um, uh, a lovely story. So a living heritage represented in the graveyards, whereas we're there as archaeologists to record the stones. And not only do we learn from the communities about 
different social practices relating to burial, but we also learned some very important things. Uh, a lady called Bernie White down in West Cork taught us this lesson. She said, John, my grandfather had a headstone, but there was no name or date on it ever. But we always knew it. It was down in the corner of the graveyard, and it kind of, we used to call it the rabbit's ear. It was kind of shaped like that. The minute Bernie said that, my eyes opened, and we go into the graveyards now. These simple little field stones, look at them. There's no inscription on them. There's no name or nothing, but they're deliberately chosen for their shape. So... Bernie said it, all of a sudden it was obvious. <laughs> Why didn't we see it ourselves? And now everywhere we go, we find these, these specifically chosen headstones. Sometimes they're known as famine headstones, and generally they're not. They're for a family of a certain size, or a farming family of maybe 20 acres, maybe 40, I'm not sure, who didn't necessarily have the wear at all to, to buy an expensive headstone. Uh, but they brought in a field stone from the town and at home and marked granddad's head, um, grave with that or perhaps grannies or the uncle or whatever. Sometimes they'll go in in pairs. Sometimes there'll be even three of them jammed in together, maybe representing three different burial episodes. Uh, we record them. In some graveyards, these are twi there's twice as many uninscribed headstones as there are inscribed headstones. Uh, inscribed headstones, this is a field stone again, uh, except there is an epitaph inscribed on it. Uh, without the right tools, without the right gear, but still important enough them to, to record the name and the address. I love this one from Brigown in County in, in, in Mitchellstown. Uh, very simple cross and initials, PB, somebody's name, K, not really sure what that means, but uh, hints, and to me, uh, these are primary historic documents, and they're sort of like postcards I find from the past. A simple little, uh, you know, um, no moan, no fun, your son type of a message from the past. <laughs> I need to work it out. And <laughs> ev every, one of, every one of these is, to us is, has got clues from the past. Uh, we were in a graveyard, uh, Dr. Jane Lyons is there, we were in a graveyard the other day, uh, in, in Leash, and uh, whenever we were looking at the biography of the people who died, Jane was very good because she was saying, oh, they died very young, may have died from this. Uh, it could have been these kind of circumstances. Uh, so there, there's a chance to reconstruct people's lives from the headstones. Simple grave markers are one thing. As materials became cheaper, um, we also see families being able to afford their own headstones, maybe making their own concrete um, headstones. Usually the forms for these are made by the local carpenter. The carpenter would make the form and then they would reuse it. Sometimes you'll see neighbours' relationships represented in the graveyard because Paddy was a carpenter. Paddy made his own headstone and also did one for his pal and his neighbour down the road and the fellow he was at school with. You'll see that kind of uh, uh, record. Very simple and lovely. Everywhere we go, we record those. Uh, it was Jim, Jim Higgins was here earlier. Um, I saw uh, Jim talked about these up in graveyards in County Galway as well. As well as those uh, homemade ones, you'd also get these monumental um, uh, grave memorials. This is in the graveyard in St. John's in Kilkenny, uh, uh, and this uh, um, stone here on the right, uh, it's fantastic, very powerful, um, uh, beautifully cut, and it has eight foot foundations. These are monumental um, uh, 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 um, uh, memorials, and the, they're as big under the ground as they are above the ground. As well as that, we'll get simple little stones like this. Down in Nanton, down in West Limerick, uh, we uh, had recently been done up by a, a FOSS group, I think, and I thought this was just a, a, a concrete block thrown off to the side and somebody had scrawled a name in the, um, in the mortar. But the local lad said, no, Mick is a surname over here. I'd never heard the surname Nick. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, so all the people from Limerick know it. So uh, this was marking a Mick grave, the Mick or the Mick family, and, and this, it got put aside. We're not sure where it belonged, but it's still there, you know. So a simple little concrete block can be a grave memorial just as much as something like this. Look at that, it's a stunning piece of work. Beautifully carved IHS in the middle with the, with the cross attached with the Christogram. There's a skull on the right, uh, uh, maybe, excuse me, maybe uh, Adam's skull. And here on the left, a snake devouring its own tail, representing what? I'm not really sure. Uh, the, the main hypothesis is that it represents eternity or infinity. Uh, yeah, um, uh, and we find this kind of evidence in, in graveyards all over the country. Uh, if it's carved in stone, then it was also probably... Um, uh, commonly encountered by ordinary people in their daily lives. These, this is a, a, a reference given to me by uh, Louise um, Nugent. Uh, it's uh, pilgrim's crosses carved in wood. People would have had these hanging in their cottages at home. Uh, uh, the sacred heart lamp of their, of their day. Uh, and here, they, the, all the iconography that's on these wooden crosses is what we find on the headstones. So to my mind, the stone is, 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 uh, is probably will last longer than these wooden remains, but it represents the same, um, uh, the same heritage. And here, uh, here, the same kind of iconography now being found in iron gates uh, going into a, a graveyard. This is in County Kilkenny. Uh, the, uh, St. Peter's Keys and uh, the IHS, very strong elements that we'll commonly see. 
I, I put in this photograph because it shows uh, an iron uh, coffin rest going into a graveyard in County Offaly. I hadn't seen one, an iron one before. I thought it was lovely. Uh, and the other one here on the side, this is actually, I was going to talk a bit about, more about it, but I'm not now. This is actually a cure stone, if I can. That hollow in there, there's a hollow on that stone. And if you put your head, if you have a bad headache and put your head against the hollow, you'll get a cure. Uh, uh, so uh, it's a common element that we'll see inside in graveyards like that. As well as those simple little field stones, then we also see these stunning works of art all over the country. Every single county has got them, and they're absolutely invigorating when we find them. We found a lovely new one up in um, Killermo the other day in, in County Leash. This one is down outside Killa in County Cork, and look at that. You have to admire the stone cutting there, the technique, um, uh, the long traditions that went into that. And here's another lovely one from a man called Bernie Hunt, who's um, based in... Um, uh, thank you, in County uh, uh, Offaly. Uh, Bernie had a, a DOI shop in, uh, in Banagher and he had access to, uh, glass to glass and to tiles. So he used to make, he used to make, uh, his, uh, he used to make Celtic crosses and this variant of it and he used to decorate them themselves. Very distinctive, beautifully rich and the community are very proud of them. We work with communities to do standard area surveys but we also do theme surveys. This was a project we did in Kilkenny with two military historians. We went into 50 odd graveyards around the county uh, recording the um, military related um, headstones. We started off doing British Army ones and then we realised that was a mistake. So we did all military. Uh, whether they were in the Boer War or after in the War of Independence, Civil War, it didn't matter. Uh, British Army recorded everybody equally and it was a far more uh, 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 interesting project. When it comes to doing the surveys, how do we do it? The key tools we use are here. You saw the Lenser P7. That's the GPS camera that we use, about 30 euro, 300 euro, excuse me, standard family camera, except it has a little GPS chip in it. And also, uh, the main tool we use on, uh, of an afternoon is a mirror. If you bounce the afternoon light with a mirror, it shines up the inscription very well and it makes the headstone quite easy to read. And behind all that, the key tool that we use is actually a roll of masking tape because what we do is we number every single headstone inside in the graveyard. The average Irish graveyard has 150 headstones. We start at the back, one, two, three. We stick the numbers and masking tape on the back. Once the numbers are on, the brain can relax. Mary, will you go up there and check that one in the corner? Mary goes up, it's number 15. She knows what it is because the number is on it. Um, uh, when we put the numbers on, we number each memorial and then we take a single photograph of each memorial by number. So if we've got 100 numbers on headstones, then we only, at the end of the survey day, we have 100 photographs. Okay, it's a very important step. If we want to take extra photographs of the ironwork or whatever, we'll go back the next day or the following week and do those extra details. Uh, we then do a sketch plan of the relative location of the headstones in the graveyard and then we um, uh, fill in the record sheets in pairs and we, we actually fill up, uh, we put them straight online but we also fill up uh, uh, um, a folder. We build an on-site archive of the remains. So here's a sketch plan done of the relative location of the graveyards. This is a, a check sheet that we do showing the progress on the site. We tick the boxes when number one is done and so on. There's the blank for the spreadsheet the sequence of filling in the sheets. Here's a chap down in West Limerick and his name has gone from you now, but he three different graveyards inside in that folder there. Uh, he did a night, night class with us uh, over in West Limerick and he went off and did those quietly uh, by himself. We put them to the website. They're up on historicgraves.com. Once they're all up, this is a very important uh, button. The editor for the graveyard then can download the whole data set onto their own computers. So it's up online. We share it uh, every year or two with the county library services, but the communities can download it immediately. So they've got complete access to their own data. Okay, we then do a search by, uh, uh, you can do um, different searches by, by graveyard name. Now, we've come across a number of different uh, stone cutters in the county. Uh, Michael Beery's one here, very plain, very simple. You can see he probably had a bit of problem with the stone and that he had to inset uh, the whole epitaph. Uh, and these are the places where we found Michael Beery's um, headstones. I'm rushing through now. Uh, a fantastic family that have headstones all over the county are the Keane family. Liam O'Flynn has published his own family research in, in the Keane family, and it's also online on the Limerick Museum uh, website a fantastic uh, document. Uh, read that in detail. Here you can see the standard Keen uh, headstones. There's a headstone on the left, there's an older one with the round head and there's a Celtic cross on the right. Um, some lovely stories are related to the Keens that I won't go into, but these are all the locations that we've got Keen family headstones recorded by the community groups uh, uh, all over the county. In fact, they go right down into Kilbehany, right down in the south border and they sold all over the county and how they, they, they ran a good business and they also advertised their wares because they signed an awful lot of their headstones. 
Uh, and then the family that I think has, has rung a bell with me more than the others is the Bolster family. The Bolsters, uh, we first came across, I was visiting my parents down in South Limerick and I was early, so I went into a little graveyard outside Kilmallock and I said, crikey, what's that? I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I was looking at a stone very like this. It was carved differently to the other ones that, that I had seen. What this cutter was doing, he was cutting out the spaces around the shape rather than cutting out the shape itself, if I can do that. He was working in relief and in false relief. And uh, it, was one of, it was a stone just like this. And now, in the space of uh, 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 the last two years, uh, Amanda and Colum Hardy, in particular, have found uh, uh, over 50 of these headstones all around the county. Um, this is a headstone by a Charles Bolster in Kilfinnan. And you can see, again, he's using that false relief uh, methodology. The previous one uh, was 1820s. This is about 1830s. These then are Joseph Bolster, who's the, the chap that we've been following. Uh, we first spotted Joseph Bolster's headstone on this, the, the famous Galloway grave in Kilfinnan um, Church of Ireland. And if you're from Kilfinnan, you'll know this grave because the tradition is if you go three times around it, counterclockwise then you'll draw the devil or Galloway himself from the grave and this man who told me the story says everybody gets two and a half times around it <laughs> and then stops but the beauty of it is right down the bottom the, 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 the table slab is actually signed J Bolster the first indication that we had a name very plain not at all what we, what we got to recognise as Bolster headstone but once we had his name there you, there you see it, J. Bolster Fetchit, F-E-C-I-T, made this. And then we went to a graveyard over in Ballinakill, I think it was, and we found four of them signed, just like this, and all signed by Joseph Bolster. Um, so we've tracked Bolster now around the county. There you can see, that's very much in his prime. As I came up this morning, uh, and I passed Anhid outside Croom, and Colm O'Regan brought me in there a year and a half ago. He's passed away since, and Colm brought me into Croom. And there's another Bolster headstone inside in Croom, very much one of his works of art. And everywhere we go around the country, to my mind, Bolster stands out. These are all the Bolster headstones that we have in the system. We can pull them all out, take the photographs. We've recorded uh, folklore that relates to the site down in Tully Lees, where there is a Bolster headstone. And one of the stories told by Mike Larkin is actually about uh, a stone cutter who had eye problems and who was, uh, who had, uh, uh, who was healed by St. Berahertz down in Tully Lees and continued to be a stone cutter thereafter. And ever since now, we've found out that the Bolsters actually lived on Main Street in Charleville. And in fact, they're registered. They have a second address in, in Slater's directory. Uh, where are they? They're in um, the turrets. And some of the turrets are still there in Charleville. So it would be lovely to see if we could actually find the Bolsters family home. And this is the distribution of the Bolster headstones. So I, I said I, I showed you this at the start, uh, and I'm going to finish on this. Uh, when this was in Clancru, it was an evening session last summer, and when we read that site uh, first, we saw March 25th, 1826, and then we said, wait a minute, that's actually not uh, just a six, there's a five under the six, and there's a second instead of a 25th, can you see that? So then we said, maybe it's March the 2nd, 1825, and then one of the keen eyed amongst us says, wait a minute, John, there's an O under the M, can you see that? <laughs> the A was a C, the R was a T, the C was an O. Okay, the H was a B, something went on here. So we said maybe it was October the 5th, 1825. So that was our other option. But then when we teased it out and did our various measurements, we think what happened was that the first carving said October the 5th, 1825, and then somebody said you got it wrong. Uh, 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 and we think the final cutting then, what they did was they sanded down a few millimetres off the face of the stone and they cut it again and they fixed it. And they fixed it to March the 2nd, 1826. And I think as well as sanding down and cutting again, I think they also had the option to fill in some of the lettering too. Uh, if you can cut, you can also refill. If you can recut, you can also refill. So I'm going to leave you with that. Very, thank you very much.